Morning. Heritage Church, Round Lake Beach. I tell you, when um, I got the call from Justin a few weeks back uh, to see if I would be available for speaking on this week, uh, I got giddy. Number one, because I got to hear Justin's voice again, and that's always such a joy, right? Uh, privilege. Um, I, I can honestly state this, though, man. Uh, God moving my wife and I to Illinois, one of the, the privileges we've had is to get to know Justin and Courtney and um, their incredible family, one of which was drumming today. I tell you, he, I, when I walked in the building earlier this morning, he was drumming with somebody that, with, with strength and wisdom and authority of somebody twice his age, twice his weight, twice his height. What an amazing drummer that is. But secondly, yeah. Um, secondly, I heard rumors about this screen. I didn't see it for myself until today. What a blessing that is, so crisp and clear. But thirdly, and I think this is the biggest thing, every time I get to come to Round Lake Beach, uh, my heart gets so full of people that are just making a difference. We have such an amazing volunteer team here that every Sunday just lay themselves out to provide the atmosphere that the rest of us get to walk into. Can we appreciate the volunteer team here? <clears throat> Today we're going to be looking at um, family trees. Doesn't that sound exciting? Um, you know, I was uh, kind of thinking through our genealogies and everything, and, I, and I, this is my guess. I haven't polled everyone, but that my guess is that every one of us has some quirkiness back in our family trees. Am I right? So, so maybe some things we're really proud of, some things that we see not too sure about. I know everyone here is totally normal and perfect, right? But, but our trees, our lineage, way back when... Um, when Ancestry.com came out, and uh, I mean, what, what, uh, everybody was like exploring uh, what their roots are, who was in their past. One of my wife's favorite TV shows on PBS is Finding Your Roots by Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. Anybody seen that? She loves that, and it's kind of fascinating. It draws you in, all these celebrities, you know, deep diving into their past. And, and you could tell the people that are famous or done something really good, uh, you know, they get a smile and they're proud. But when something gets discovered that, you know, they're not too sure about, you know, their face drops, you could just kind of watch this whole thing play out on PBS. You know, I, I know when my grandparents passed away, some things came to light in my family that uh, I wish I would have never known. And I think that's probably true for everyone. I read recently about a guy who spent $500 on Ancestry.com to try to explore his heritage. And then when he found out, he spent five times that amount to rebury that man. That makes sure nobody else knows that. Right? Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that um, we all have. We all have a family tree. And, and I, I, I can't wait to read you the passage that we're going to dive into today. In fact, I'm not going to wait. I'm just going to read it. You ready for this? It's uh, the beginning of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1. Ready? It says this, this is the record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and, Abraham, uh, and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, first woman mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. I know. Isn't that exciting? Riveting. Some of you are going, man, I got up to come to church to hear this. I, no, stick with me. Because what we have here is a little bit of a family tree 
for uh, Jesus Christ, okay, who was born on Christmas. And just we're going to celebrate that in a couple of weeks. You know, it's interesting because um, this, these 18 verses at the beginning of, of Matthew are the ones that more often than not we just skip over to the good stuff. In verse 18, you know, it talks about the Christmas story, and that's what we want to dive into. But somehow, Matthew thinks this is important. You had the whole Old Testament, then there was about 200 years of silence, and then Matthew comes onto the scene, and everybody's like, come on, Matthew, bring it. And he starts out with this long list of names. This is almost like sitting through a commencement, right? You don't sit through a commencement unless your family or just a really, really, really dear friend. Because there's 99% of the names that you have no context, you don't know who they are, they're just kind of fill in and tell the one name that you might recognize and have a relationship with. This is Matthew. And, and you kind of wonder why Matthew wanted to start with something as boring as this. You know, um, actually there is a really good reason. Um, in the Jewish culture, uh, genealogies were so important. Uh, a genealogy, your family tree, you know, the, this is the first Christmas tree, by the way, I wanted to add that. Um, you know, the, your family tree could either make, it, make you or break you in society. That's how important genealogies were. They would identify with their family of origin. So since Matthew was writing to the Jewish culture, this was incredibly normal right? Um, so he starts out with, you know, bloodline being traced to the greatest king of Israel, you know, David, which makes total sense. Jesus couldn't come and proclaim himself as the king of the Jews unless there was some royal blood going through his veins. And then the second person mentioned is Abraham. I mean, the founding father of, of Israel. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, that's my Jesus. Yeah. Look at his lineage. But when we dig a little deeper, which I've never really done until I had this opportunity to kind of put this together for Christmas, um, you, you find nuggets of people that you wouldn't really normally put in such an incredible lineage such as Jesus Christ. So I, I want to just take three of those names and kind of with a big picture, bird's eye perspective, um, just kind of dive into these three names of this lineage, okay, that we read this morning. And I think each of these people is going to encourage you in some way. All right? That's my prayer. Um, as we go through these characters, I want to ask that you picture yourself in some of these quandaries they found themselves in and these confusing events in their life. And consider this, that Jesus came from those people to reach us people. All right? You in? Okay, the first guy I want to dive into uh, shows us that Jesus Christ came through and for the doubt filled. And this guy was the second person in this genealogy. His name was Abraham. And I'm just going to, again, just give a broad perspective of just highlights of this story. Uh, I hope to tease you enough to want to go home and read about it yourself. Okay, so I'm going to give the passages. We first meet um, Abraham um, in Genesis chapter 12. And, and God appears to Abraham. Now, we don't know, but I don't think Abraham had a relationship with God at this point. So can you imagine just minding your own business and God showing up? Whoa, right? What does God say? And in verse 1 of chapter 12 of Genesis, the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. Now, the second part of that verse is pretty cool, isn't it? Man, I'm going to be a great nation. I'm going to be a blessing to everybody around me. But the first part, just put yourself in this situation. God is telling Abraham to get up 
it, out of a, 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 a town, Haran, that he has been his whole life. He met Sarah, his wife, there. And they built this life. He had a great reputation, great um, environment, his family, his friends, everybody was there. And God is telling Abraham to pick up everything and go. And he doesn't even tell him where, just to a land. That's pretty vague, isn't it? Can you imagine what that conversation with his wife Sarah would look like? Um, Babe, um, you, you always wanted to travel, <laughs> you know, and, um, uh, you know, and explore and, and have new adventures. Well, uh, pack up because uh, we're going to go on a trip. For, for how long? Uh, um, probably the rest of our lives. Really? Where are we going? Mm. Um, D- didn't really get that, uh, uh, but God told me that he would show me once we get there. So you're, you're saying that if uh, you get lost, who would you ask for directions? Uh, well, God, of course. Did you get God's last name? Again, great question. Love where you're going with that. But no, no, I didn't. And you want me just to pack up and leave everything behind. Boy, the um, next uh, verse in verse 4, it says that Abraham did as God told him to do. Do you think there was just maybe a little doubt ringing in his mind as he was preparing to leave? You better believe it. This is amazing. It says he was 75 years old when God came to him. So he was already well past his prime. Sarah was 10 years younger than him. This is amazing. And as I was kind of looking at that, um, let me just pause for a moment and ask, do you ever trust God like that? Is God asking you to leave anything? As we enter into the Christmas season, uh, any sin, any addiction, any fear, is God asking you to go someplace that you just have some doubts and you're not really sure about, like maybe even joining a volunteer team here that makes such a difference? Um, Maybe um, you're going on a missions trip. And blessing someone around the world. And maybe it doesn't have to be around the world. Maybe just blessing somebody in your sphere of influence here. To step outside of your comfort zone and just trust God. It's amazing that Abe said, good, I'm good with that. Let's go. And you know, I, can't, I can't help but think, what in the world would have happened if he would have said no? No, I don't want to do this. It's too big of ask. I have too many doubts. Meanwhile, back to Abraham, the story there. There is a second part to God's request, right? It was a part of a blessing, actually, that you were going to be the father of a great nation. And there was a problem with that because Sarah wasn't able to have kids. And so for the next several chapters, you know, they kind of work around God a little bit to try to give Abraham, uh, you know, a a lineage of descendants. Um, To the point where in Genesis 17, God has to come again to give another round of clarity. And he says this, when Abraham was 99 years old, just stop there, 99 he, he got called to this new land at 75. So 24 years have passed since God promised him to be a great nation, the father of a great nation. So he's 99. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty, serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I may, will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. My boy Abraham's pretty old. His wife is 89, right? She's well past childbearing age. And it uh, it said that that Abraham just kind of laughed, okay? 
Then Sarah ended up laughing in, in verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 10. And then one of them, the Lord said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from a tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also sold? I'm sure Abraham enjoyed that, a uh, bit of sarcasm. It just was absurd. Do you think you would have a little bit of doubt rummaging through your head as you heard God say this? Abraham and Sarah had to go through a lot of doubt. And then Isaac is born. The, the promise of uh, the fulfillment of the promise. And... Uh, they ain't named him Isaac because that means he laughs. Uh, in Genesis 21, and Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? And yet I have given Abraham a son in my old age. Everybody that would hear about this would just chuckle. They'd have to. Who has ever heard of a baby being born in a retirement home? I, you know, and, and can you just see Sarah... Shop in, um, man, what's right down the road? Uh, Meyer, Meyer, is that Meyer's? Um, you know, and she's filling up her bin with uh, Pampers and Depends. It's kind of funny. And the only food she's putting in is like strained vegetables because nobody in their household has teeth at this point, right? It's just funny. It's an incredible story of God coming through and for the doubt filled. Maybe God is telling you today in this Christmas season, are you willing to take a step of trust towards me to allow me to show you up close and personal that I am a God that can take, work through, and defeat any doubt you may have? Man. Uh, secondly, he came through and for the disillusioned. Isaac. Isaac is the son that was birthed to Abraham and Sarah. Now, you talk about disillusionment because in, um, in, in Matthew it says Abraham is the father of Isaac, Isaac is the father of Jacob. But in Ma uh, Genesis chapter 22, we find where Isaac really comes into the story. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Pause there for a second. Because this is such a gift to every reader of this story. Because we know up front that this is just a test. But remember, please remember, when Abraham was going through it, he did not know this was just a test. All right? And God um, woke him up. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here am I. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, who you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Can you just picture yourself again in Abe's shoes? What? You promised me, Isaac. It was really miraculous how Isaac even came to our, you know, possession as a child. You, you said that he was going to be the father of a great nation and that it was going to come through Isaac. You were going to bless the nation through Isaac. Are, are you telling me now to kill the blessing? Yeah. Man, the very next verse, verse 3, the next morning Abraham got up early. You talk about some tough obedience. How in the world do you get that by Sarah? Right? Uh, hon, uh, me and the boy, we're going to go up to a mountain and do some sacrificing today. Oh, man, that's great. You guys have a good time? I'll have some dinner ready when you get back? Hmm. About that. Only cook for one. Tonight, how, how do you say that, right? 
You talk about total disillusionment here. It says as they were walking up the mountain, Isaac, you know, has been sacrificing with his dad quite a bit. And he said, Dad, I, I, I see some wood and, and some other things that will need some rope, but I don't see a sacrifice. How do you tell your son you are the sacrifice? They get up there on the mountain, they build the altar, and he ties his son up, and he's over sharpening his knife. And I'm... I'm I tell you, if you don't have a prayer life at that point, you're praying like crazy, right? Oh, man, God, I came all the way up here. You know I love you, and I, I'm, I'm faithful to you, and I'm, I'm trying to do what you asked me to do. But God didn't say to just go up the mountain. He's standing over his boy, and his, his hand is above him with the knife. And he, God, come on, do something. But God didn't say just hold a knife above him. So I was, he was about to bring that knife down and make his obedience absolute. God intervened and grabbed his hand and said, um, don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. That's tough. You know, it was in a culture where there was a lot of infant sacrifice during that time frame, a lot of human sacrifice. But God had told Abraham over and over again that you do not do that. He's, he's been teaching his son that we don't do that. And now God was testing him to say, well, why? All this disillusionment must have been just so overwhelming. And God says, now I know you truly fear me. How, how do you fear God? What does that mean? Give all to God. Respect him. Do what he says. It's about as simple as that. The reason why we don't do what God says is because sometimes we just don't fear him. Oh, God's not going to do anything. He's a gracious God. He's forgiving. He's understanding. He's loving. You know, all those cliches when we don't want to do what God says. You know, um, this is interesting to me because sometimes we are disillusioned, especially even maybe going into this Christmas season. And, and, and the things that we are facing and things that we've heard that maybe we should do, but we don't really know if it makes sense or not. You know, one of the verses that I have fallen back on over and over again during my life is, is Jeremiah 29. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. It says at the end of that story up the mountain that an angel came and blessed Abraham. You know, he would have missed that blessing if he hadn't just made that step to obey. Man, I want you guys to receive the blessing that comes through obedience to maybe face the disillusionment in your own life because Jesus who was born on Christmas, came through and for the disillusioned. Lastly, um, he came through and for the shame-filled Judah. Uh, it says in Matthew that Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers, okay? Some of you know the story about Joseph. Maybe you've heard the Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat, something along that line, okay? So, so, so Joseph was, a, man, a great character in the Bible. He was a leader. He's very Christ-like in some of his responses to things. Uh, I mean, he, he would be the guy that I would want my lineage to, to be, not Judah, Judah was a scoundrel. But, you know, Jesus came on Christmas, and one of his titles was the Lion of Judah, not the Lion of Joseph. But there were 12 brothers, uh, which ended up being kind of the founding people of the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And, and, and just a couple of things, and you, we find this in, in chapters 37 and 38, and I'm going to breeze through this, so hopefully I'll just whet your appetite to dive in yourself and read it. But in chapter 37, Joseph was hated amongst his brothers because he was kind of like the, the favorite of, of uh, Jacob. And so Ju- Judah uh, was kind of the, the head uh, son because he was the oldest. And it's, it's, it, there's a story about when Joseph went out to see his brothers and they were plotting to kill Joseph, to get him out of their hair forever. Okay? So Judah, it doesn't say that was his idea, but he kind of started leading as the oldest brother. This is the scoundrel. He said, well, instead of killing, you know, that would get, us, get him out of our hair, but why don't we do something profitable? There's a, there's a caravan that's going to Egypt, and I bet we can sell our brother Joseph as a slave, and, and he'd be out of our hair, and plus we'd get some income. All right? Win-win. His brothers fell for that. Did it. Sold him off. They, they took his coat, his multicolored coat. They tore it up and put some blood on it and, and probably had several rehearsals to make sure it lands right for their father and, and said, man, he must have been killed by a wild animal. And, and one of the things I want you to think through for a second is long, years, after all the money they gotten for selling Joseph had disappeared, the guilt for that lived on. Every family fun- function, an empty chair, they saw their father wallow in grief. Hey, what a scoundrel. You talk about some shame being put right into Jesus' bloodline. Front and center, third verse in. But that's not the pinnacle. The next chapter, chapter um, 38 of Genesis, Judah had three sons. And his oldest son, Ur, married a woman named Tamar. All right? You recognize the name because that was was the first woman in Jesus' genealogy. Right? Ur, unfortunately, died before Tamar could have any children, okay? And God's law that was set in place for the Jewish culture was written to protect widows in that situation. And so according to the law, the next unmarried son in line would then have the responsibility to marry the widow so that she could have a a line, a heritage, a descendants herself. Okay, that was part of the law. And so the next one in line was Omen. And Onan probably was dating someone else and yet had to be forced to marry this Tamar. Uh, With all that resentment, um, you can read it yourself, but let me just say he, he never completed the act. Okay, God saw that. And because he disobeyed God's law, God's anger rained down and killed Onan. Okay? Now, put yourself in Judah's position, the dad. You've already lost two sons to Tamar. You have one more son, uh, Sheila, that uh, is not old enough yet to be married, but there's not a chance you will let him marry her, even though that's what God's law said. So what he does is tells Tamar, go to, back to your hometown, live with your, your father's household, mourn, and then when uh, Sheila gets old enough, I'll send him to marry you. Never intending to do that. Years go by. This, is, this, this plot, Hollywood could not even make up. Tamar hears that... Um, Judah, the scoundrel, was coming into her town to do some uh, shearing of sheep. So she takes off her her widow's um, mourning outfit, puts on veils as a prostitute, sits beside the the road that she knows he's going to pass. Sure enough, he propositions her. Doesn't know who she is. 
And, and um, he, she wisely gets some, like a, um, a, a, a rope, a stake, um, and a, a, a signet, you know, to prove that it was him. Okay? She gets pregnant with twins. So that's why it says in Matthew 1 um, that Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Judah is the father. Now, you talk about some shame. This, this is the stuff that at the family reunions, you wouldn't even want to mention. We don't talk about that. We kind of want buried, right? And yet this is right in Jesus' genealogy. You have people that were doubt-filled. You have people that um, were disillusioned. You have people that were full of shame, that were part of the genealogy of Jesus, who came through them and for them. This is the stuff you want to bury, unless, for some reason, it brings hope. This part of the scripture that I have passed over countless times throughout my life to get to the good stuff, the Christmas story, is so rich. I know there's people here that have doubt. That God is asking, man, work through that. Just take a step, a next step in trusting me. There are people here that have been disillusioned by their life, by circumstances, maybe even by the church. That God is saying, just take a step. Trust me this Christmas. And there's some people I know almost every one of us, including myself, that have so much shame that Jesus wants to take and to free you this Christmas season. I know that because he came through these people for you and for me. Will you bow with me in prayer? And, and, and as we close, I just want to ask, um, I don't know which of those stories triggered something in your own heart. But I, I want to pray for the, the people with the relationship in this room first. And then I just want to pray for people that might be just considering who this God is and why they need to care. So God, um, man, I, I thank you for not hiding the bad stuff Lord because it does bring hope into our lives Lord we might have written that genealogy different maybe you wouldn't have people with so much doubt and so much disillusionment and then so much shame in the lineage of a baby that was born in a manger at Christmas Lord, I, I pray that uh, for those of us that have a relationship with you, that you will work in our heart even today to be encouraged in what you did to save us from doubt, from disillusionment, and from our shame. And Lord, I know there's people in this room that might not know you might have heard about you, might have maybe even heard some wonderful things about you. But Lord, they're considering taking just the very next step. Lord, thank you for coming as a baby and living a perfect life, a life that just poured wisdom into us. Told us about who God is and told them about the kingdom of God. Lord, um, but was the perfect sacrifice for our guilt and our shame. 
when you hung on the cross and your blood was shed. You covered our sin once and for all. The things that we've done in our past and the things we'll still do in our future. We can walk out of here absolutely forgiven and free and walk in newness of life. So Father, for those of us that are listening, that, that maybe have that going through our heart. Um, I'm just going to ask that you could say a prayer or something like this. Dear Lord, thank you for your love for me. And thank you for taking the hit on that cross that I deserved because of your love for me. Lord, right now, I want to accept you as the leader of my life for the rest of my life and the forgiver of my life for the rest of my life. Lord, I want to deal with the shame that I have in my life that I've been burying for years, maybe. I want to walk out of here free. Lord, with you by my side, the doubt, the disillusionment, And I just ask that if you've set, uh, said a prayer like that between you and God, uh, could you just mark that on that uh, connect card that Pastor Justin was talking about earlier? There's a little box that said, I made a decision for Christ or I took a next step in my relationship to Christ today. If you could just mark that before you turn that in. And we have a special gift in a lobby called the Following Jesus Box. We want to celebrate with you. We want to resource you in those very first next steps. God, thank you for a church like this that is a light to this community during this time of year and throughout the year. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray.